Good evening. As September comes to a close, it's a special time. It's a time when our entire community is united in a common goal to celebrate and support those that are affected by breast cancer. Together, we will raise money for education and research for Susan G. Komen, Northwest Ohio. Over 20,000 people will join together this Saturday and Sunday to walk, run, share, and pray. It's all of us at our very best. As you know, the goal our program Time Waste for No One is to improve the awareness of our community about different medical topics and the power that comes from information. The good news is that when discovered early, breast cancer is highly curable. Join us tonight on Time Waste for No One. Today we are going to talk about breast cancer. We touched base about this subject before and we want to visit the issue again because we know how important to uh, women in this country and how is the percentage of breast cancer is stabilized in the last few years, but we want to see how is it in Northwest Ohio and Southeast Michigan. And it's my pleasure to welcome to our show, uh, Mary Westfall, who is the director of uh, Coleman Northwest Ohio, Thank you for being here. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Dr. Kabor. You are more than. I'm going to start first with the race. Mm -hmm. You want to tell us when it's going to be, what is uh, the process. We want probably the largest crowd hopefully this year. I do want the largest crowd this year because the Race for the Cure is our signature fundraising event. Absolutely. It is how we raise the money to save lives locally and to fund research. The race is Sunday, September 27th. It starts at 9.30 down here, downtown. Mm -hmm. But the festivities start around 8 o'clock in the morning, and it is a family event. There are runners, there are walkers, there are dancers, there is entertainment along the way. So it's a fun family event, but most importantly, it's the most important way to raise dollars to save lives in the fight against breast cancer. So we ask people to uh, go online and register for the Race for the Cure. They can do that at our Coleman website, and they can do that through WTOL. And we also encourage people to go out to Brandy's Ford in Maumee on the 24th, the 25th, or the 26th. And they can register right there and get their t-shirt and their packet and be ready to go, all good to go. And there is registration on race morning, but there is an upcharge on race morning. So if you race, if you register before race m morning, it's $30 for adults, $20 for 18 and under. But if you register on race morning, it's $45. Still, that money goes to a very important cause. I think we still have to collect more than that. I mean, yes, this is a for a good cause, and we should really support that uh, effort. Uh, what was the number of um, the people got involved in the race uh, for Cure last year, so and what are you expecting this year? So last year we had about 14,000 participants, wow. and we had unanticipated another 15 to 20,000 spectators. Mm -hmm. So they anticipated there was about 30 to 35,000 people downtown last year and what fun that is. This year we're hoping for similar numbers, but one of the things that we do know is some of these for-profit events that are coming in are tapping into us. Mm -hmm. We definitely see things that are um, pulling some of our numbers a little bit. So we think we'll be close to that 14 number, but that's why it's so important that everybody that's listening today go in and register because these dollars stay local. They fund uh, breast cancer mammograms, treatment, uh, diagnostic procedures for women who are uninsured and underinsured, and as you know, men also get breast cancer and they mm -hmm. can also tap into the services Absolutely. that we fund. And we also fund research. So the dollars that go to this Race for the Cure really are impacting local lives. And one of the most important things is the registration gets us to the starting line, but 
fundraising beyond that is most important. And if people would just ask their friends, people are happy to give $10 to this important Absolutely. cause. We know that last year, thanks to the good work that we were able to do through the Race for the Cure with our close friends and partners like the Northwest Ohio Ford Dealers and WTOL, we were able to provide services to over 12,000 women in our service area. And we were also able to diagnose uh, many people with breast cancer that got their mammograms at stage one, the earliest possible stage, mm -hmm. so that they now are going to be in a much better place from a health perspective. Now, earlier we were discussing uh, what you are doing lately, and you told me specific numbers for how many mammograms mm -hmm. you sponsored, guys, and how many diagnostic other yes. testing. Can you tell yes, us about yes, that? Yes, yes. We did about 2,000 mammograms last year. We had another 7,000 women who received services, whether they were diagnostic services, treatment services, patient assistance services, and community awareness outreach services. So we felt like that was a huge progress. And one of the things that people need to know is that we raise about a million dollars through the race, and that million dollars comes back here. 500,000 went to uh, fund grant programs for local organizations like the Mercy System, um, you know, CareNet, the Y, all receive funds to provide mammograms and, and support service to uninsured and underinsured sure. women. And 25% goes to fund research. So it, we are a very important cause. And with all of the options for people with races these days, Dr. Kabor, people are forgetting about the importance of breast cancer. But I ask everyone to stop and pause for a moment and think about the people in their lives that they know that have been Absolutely. touched by breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Whether you're a man or a woman, if you have a mother, a grandmother, a daughter, a sister that's touched by breast cancer, you're touched by breast cancer. This is the most important cause. We know that one in eight women in her lifetime, in their lifetime, will be diagnosed with breast cancer, and we know that we're making great progress, but there's still a lot of work in front of us. Is it at one point uh, common uh, of Northwest Ohio are going to start working with these local organizations to uh, sponsor some of the genetic studies? You know, it's interesting that you ask that question. Right now, it really depends on what they apply for through the grants that we sure. do. So let me explain a little bit about how that works, because sure. I think it's very important mm -hmm. for your listening audience to understand this. We raise the money through the Race for the Cure, and we put out a request for application to all the nonprofit organizations in our 24 county service area, mm -hmm. and we invite them to apply for the funds. And then we have an independent review panel that reviews those and then awards the funding to these organizations. So first and foremost, the individuals need to apply for the grant funds. Okay. And so there will be, will be some opportunity to look at grants in the genetics mm -hmm. area, and we would encourage people to apply for those. And then based on dollars available, that completely depends on what kind of success we have with the race, then we can fund those things. Last year we funded uh, $500,000 directly to uh, nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm. but we had another $700,000 in grant requests that we could not fund. Uh, we did have $300,000 that went to research, and we had another $200,000 that went to community outreach and awareness. So the dollars are being well spent. We're very good stewards. There's never enough funds to support the Absolutely. grants we get, Absolutely. and and every penny makes a difference. So if everybody that's listening would donate $10 in addition to their race registration, we could fund every grant fully, which would be our dream come true. Absolutely. I, and, and I really... You are doing a great job, guys, and uh, no question about it. Without your organization, probably uh, Northwest Ohio will not be the same when it comes to breast cancer. And we encourage, really, not only individuals who I, I have no doubt will be touched if they have a family member who had breast cancer or not, but also the local organization. We are hoping that they will be more generous and more supportive to programs like this because we are serving the needy people. We are serving the people who need that help financial and emotional and medical. And for that reason, uh, you know, I really encourage every organization to, you know, try your best. I think that would be the best way to spend your money. Thank you very much and really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Kabor. My pleasure and honor to be with you this Thank evening. You. Thank you so much. may take place in September, but Komen Northwest Ohio keeps going all year long. In fact, 
the majority of what you give stays right here in Northwest Ohio and Southeast Michigan, providing life-saving breast health services for local patients and families, with the rest dedicated toward research to finding cures. At Komen Northwest Ohio, the race never ends. See how you can help at ComenNWOhio.org. The race for the cure is about so much more than breast cancer awareness now. It's about survivorship and celebration. And the funds raised through today's efforts mean the Susan G. Komen organization can keep fighting the good fight against the disease. I'm part of a community now, you know, that, and it's nice, it's nice to feel the love. And this is our New Year's Day, it's a big celebration, but it's also our biggest fundraiser, so it's essential that we have, you know, get folks to come out and support the cause, because this is how we make our grants to the community, those organizations that are helping people who need it the most. Mm -hmm. Several of this year's largest fundraisers are first-time teams, like Team Mo, which raised nearly $6,000. Mo has been doing everything for all these people for all these years, and when we heard she had breast cancer, we wanted to just do something to give, her, give back to her and show her that she's got all the support in the World. And we wanted to circle her up with a bunch of love and support because for all she's done for us. They're a force to be reckoned with and you know Team Mo really came through big this year. I think maybe as you said they surprised themselves. So when we see teams like that it's just so amazing and we just want to say thank you to them. And Team Karen came about 45 people deep to show their survivor why they run. It's a very emotional day. It's 15 years I've been coming up here. So it's, it's a good day. It makes me feel good to be here. And Team 19 represents all walks of life and all stages of survival. I just had a mammogram and it came out okay and we're here to support my mom and his grandmother. It's no longer with us. There is victory in every step, every dollar, every voice makes a difference in the fight against breast cancer. Jen Pachano. Is your heart clock ticking? It's time to change your future with Toledo Cardiology Consultants. For many of us, eating too much salt plays a big part in causing hypertension because salt, it bulk up the volume of blood flowing through your arteries. High blood pressure will increase your chance of stroke, heart attack, and kidney disease. So read those labels and watch your salt. Come on guys, you can do it because time waits for no one. She's big on friends, big on family, and big on spirit. But 47-year-old Alice Santuri, I was like, I can beat it, I can do it. Is especially big on never giving up. I feel great, I feel wonderful. Um, it's hard for people to understand that I am dying and that this is, you know, this is my reality. Alice was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer this spring, the kind that spreads to where there's no cure. This news, after losing 87 pounds recently, River Run was really good. Oh, no. After becoming quite the runner, even completing a marathon, and after always getting her mammograms like she preached to others. I'm glad to, to be able to educate people and inspire people. And that she does as a wife and mom and a friend, especially to other breast cancer survivors. She keeps me laughing. We laugh a lot. We tease each other a lot. Um, she, she just amazes me. Told she has three to five years, she now takes more time for herself to reaffirm her strength and peace. I think we all are aware what the pink ribbon is. We know what that means, but we need to bring awareness to metastatic breast cancer too. 108 people die a day from metastatic breast cancer. I'm Katherine Bosley.
Jennifer Tesler is no stranger to adversity. She lost her first husband to cancer. Then, years later, doctor diagnosed her with aggressive stage two breast cancer. She started chemotherapy, but the side effects were debilitating. During the chemo, I was really sick. Um, my children spent many nights sleeping on the bathroom floor with me the whole night because I just couldn't get up. She found doing acupuncture before each chemo treatment was the key to relieving the symptoms that made it unbearable. We don't want to throw away all the beauty of conventional medicine, but at the same time, we don't need to throw away thousands of years of older systems of medicine that had techniques and strategies that helped to make people better. So a marriage of the two is perfect, and it really makes for great care. Dr. Taz breaks healing into three phases. In phase one, acupuncture helps to manage side effects during chemotherapy, like the nausea. Then, it helps balance the nervous system and reduce the pain and issues that arise post-treatment. And in phase three, acupuncture minimizes stress and inflammation to keep the cancer at bay. I do have an overall sense of feeling better. Almost, you know, instantly those next few days, it lifts your spirits, um, it lifts your energy, and it helps reduce your pain. For Health Minute, I'm Martha Shade. Welcome back. As we discussed basically earlier, breast cancer is becoming a major issue and major health problem in the United States. And always the best way is prevention. And today it's my pleasure to welcome Deb Ross, who is the um, educational coordinator at Mercy Cancer Center, who is specialized also in genetic uh, co coordination and management, I understand, right? Good. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for asking me. Uh, I, I want to touch base about one element which is a major trauma of the breast cancer discovery for the woman. And you deal with that on a daily basis as someone who is coordinating Mercy uh, Cancer Center. Can you tell me w how you deal with those issues with those ladies when they discover breast cancer? Well, even before they see me, we have um, breast nurse navigators that make contact provide packets of information and also guide them to make sure that they have all their appointments. You know, are you, do you have a medical oncologist? Do you have a radiation? Are you getting to where you need to be? And do you have the resources that you need mm -hmm. and, and the emotional support? So even before they see me, we're already involved with that patient and making sure that they're connected. But you know, the diagnosis is very traumatic. They're, they're the primary caregiver often of their family. They're worried about you know, their kids, their husbands, their, their jobs. and and we just provide all the resources we can to help them maintain what they need to, to that, get through. Now, this year, uh, we, we addressed breast cancer last year, but we did not include the latest discovery and the relationship between breast cancer and genetics. Uh, and, and I think that's really what you are specialized in. Can you give us uh, a summary of the relationship between the uh, family history and the genetic factors which is we could discover for those patients who has higher risk for breast cancer? Sure, about five to 10% of all women who have breast cancer, their cancer is related to a hereditary mutation. Mm -hmm. Um, we all know about BRCA1 and 2, those are, you know, I call them the kind of Angelina Jolie genes and, and that, that helps patients understand and feel more comfortable with the information. But there are, you know, besides BRCA1 and 2, are, there's a total of 13 genes that play a role in hereditary, you know, breast cancers. Um, so when we see a woman, whether she has cancer or she's just concerned about her family history, we do a full pedigree look at the family history, look for patterns. Does, is her family history suggestive that she could have something, mm -hmm. you know, hereditary going on, and then make recommendations based on that. Okay. You know, do you need testing or, you know, and then counseling them, you know, what does testing mean if it's positive, if it's negative, if there's a variant, what does that mean to your care? So based on what you are saying right now, there's two groups of people. The people who already had some suspicion of breast cancer or they are getting some treatment. So you do the genetic studies for those patients to come up with a treatment plan for the future? Right, if it's appropriate. There's not everyone that has breast cancer is appropriate for genetic testing. If, yeah. if there isn't a strong family history suggestive, of, mm -hmm. you know, if they don't have you know, first, second, and third degree relatives that are affected, they may not be appropriate for testing or if they're um, you know, triple negative breast cancer, if you're under 60, that's a recommendation, or if you're under 45, that's an automatic recommendation. Okay. But, you know, there are other, if you have family members, that also feeds in. So, yeah, counseling them, you know, would you recommend, you know, 
prophylactic oophorectomy to reduce the risk of breast cancer? And what, what is your thought about mastectomy? Because mm -hmm. a lot of ladies just really want to have a mastectomy, you know, if they if have they a mutation. If they are at high risk, if they have right. that mutation. Right. So basically by examining or doing the genetic study for that individual who had the cancer, you are trying to prevent the rest of the family member from having the cancer. Right, and prevent them from a second breast cancer, because if a BRCA mutation, they can have up to a 60% risk of a second breast cancer. Now, the second group you are talking about, the people who already have a strong family history of breast cancer, mm -hmm. not necessarily they have any cancer. They want to be sure that they are not going to have that breast cancer in the future, so they can have also that genetic study. We do what's called a, a risk assessment, and we put a lot of information into a, uh, it's a model, the Gale mm -hmm. model, mm -hmm. and it can kind of predict what their five-year and lifetime risk of developing an invasive breast cancer. And if they meet the risk criteria, we suggest chemo prevention with a drug like tamoxifen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't test those people up front. We really recommend, you know, chemo prevention or just a better surveillance plan, uh -huh. you know, alternating maybe MRI with um, Mammography, if it's appropriate, you know, just somehow altering their surveillance plan, you know, appropriately. So, uh, in in some patients who now they have that genetic marker strongly positive and they want to have that aggressive treatment, how often you see those people who wants to have mastectomy? I mean, no matter what, I mean. A, a lot of patients do come in. They just say, you know, I just want to have both of my breasts removed. Um, and what I counsel patients a lot of times is. You know, having your ovaries removed mm -hmm. because your ovaries, um, having your ovaries alone removed can prevent breast cancer by like 68%, can reduce your risk of developing breast sure. cancer by a huge percent. So I counsel women, you know, and ovarian cancer is much harder to find. And the if and it's a, and if it's a BRCA mutation or one of the other ones that cause both breast and ovarian cancer, um, to ovarian cancer is harder to find. So talk about you know the ovaries first, but there's a lot of women that really want to have both breasts removed, and I uh, counsel them, you know, it's easier to find a breast lesion, it's easier to treat, and it's not necessarily going to be 100% that you'll never get another breast cancer because there's mm -hmm. breast tissue in other places. Sure. So just helping them to understand, you know, the, the limitations of, you know, each type of um, option. Absolutely, available. absolutely, great, okay. So if we talk about the genetic test itself, um, where do you get your uh, samples to study those and uh, you know do this risk stratification for those patients? Uh, it can either be what's called a buccal sample, which is basically collecting saliva, because we're actually collecting all the cells that line you know the cheek and gum, because your genetic material is in every single cell in your body, so it doesn't matter where the cell comes sure. from. Um, some people, if it's a patient who already has cancer, maybe already has a venous access port, they you know, just want the blood sample, sure. so we'll, we can take a blood. But some people, even if you have a saliva sample, they feel that there's still a difference in uh -huh. getting genetic material and it's better from the blood. Okay. So they'll say, no, I, I, I really want you to take my blood. Uh -huh. So if they really want us to take their blood, we, we do that. And how long it takes mm -hmm. to get the uh, results of these uh, genetic testing? Um, typically about three weeks if you're doing a full panel. We do um, the genetic panels now because of there are so many genes that kind of interact, there's syndromes that overlap. Mm -hmm. And um, so we typically do panel testing and it takes about three weeks for results to come back. So sure. some, it does make patients a little anxious. They want to get their surgical procedure scheduled. They don't know if they're going to have a lumpectomy or a mastectomy. Mm -hmm. And it does cause some anxiety, but you know, it also gives you a little time to provide some more education for patients. So if, if I want you to take, take us step by step, the patient had the genetic test, you got the report, and it's very suggestive for high probability of genetic problem. And what do you do from there? Well, if the result comes back that they have a hereditary mutation, we look at what mutation that is because that tells you what the likelihood of a second breast cancer might be. Mm -hmm. um, and you can counsel your patient um, about you know oophorectomy you know to reduce their risk of breast mm -hmm. cancer and and what the benefits the limitations are of that what the benefits limitations might be of having a mastectomy mm -hmm. about you know chemo prevention about surveillance and and just really helping them giving them enough information to make the right decision for their lifestyle for for them and then you have to involve of course family members which we involve 
from the very beginning sure. because the, these disorders are tend to be autosomal dominant so they're passed down so like all their siblings you know other relatives so we, we really involve the whole family because they're not only doing the testing getting information about themselves but potentially for other family members now does the insurance uh, d uh, cover these kind of testing I mean as part of the treatment process they do I've only had a few patients where insurance is because they use the little stricter criteria we follow um, NCCN guidelines mm -hmm. um, but we have some insurances that follow Medicare guidelines that make it a little tougher to mm -hmm. do testing so uh, you know we've had just a few patients maybe that um, we couldn't test that we really wanted to, but there are a lot of ways to make that happen. And people with no insurance, I can, we can get testing. There's um, funds set aside by these companies right. that will help pay for testing for patients without. The so funds. there's no limitation really. No. Anyone is a candidate to come and have the help in your. Uh, they can uh, come and have center. the talk. They can find out. You know, am I at risk? Am I a high risk? Is my family high risk? Anyone can do that. That's yes. Great. So if I want you to give the last advice to all of the viewers who are watching our okay. program about breast cancer prevention, treatment. Mm -hmm. How can you summarize that? Um, know your family tree, know your family's health history, and um, just be proactive with the information you have. That's great. I really appreciate your help, well, thank and you. thank you for being here. Well, thank you. So, to every woman watching this show, take action. Do yourself breast exam. Schedule your mammogram this week. Ask your doctor questions. Put yourself first. Your family needs you. Remember, time waits for no one.